All right, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, two weeks ago, we concluded in our Bible overview, we concluded about the dispensation of grace. We saw when, when the rapture of the church takes place, we, we talked about that. Then um, now we're looking at Israel, the resumption of Israel's program after the rapture. And last week we went over um, how they are saved in terms of uh, it being a short work that, uh, G that Jesus will do um, due to the, the, really the apostasy of the whole world. We saw how when the, when the body of Christ is raptured up, well then uh, there aren't any believers on the earth. And so, um, but, but we saw that the rapture will be a sign to Israel and uh, cause them to believe. And so now what we're going to look at tonight is basically very briefly talk about how Israel is saved, uh, what they believe in order to be saved, and then we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at these end time events for the nation of Israel. What happens um, in, in the world after the rapture, both from the Antichrist perspective and Satan, what he's doing, and also what God is doing at the same time. Uh, so that's that's where our, we'll look at tonight. So. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind when it comes to Israel is that they are saved just like we are in that they have to believe the gospel in order to be saved. It's all about faith. Hebrews 11.6 says it is impossible to please God without faith. And so a lot of times when we look at right division, people have the idea, that the church that I learned it from, um, I would tell you the whole seven years I was there, I had the idea that we're saved by faith alone, but by but Israel is saved by faith plus having to do works under the law. And that is not the case. Uh, Israel is saved by faith alone as well. Now, James 2 does mention that they have to have works as well, but uh, as we mentioned in the Q&A last time, those works are works of faith. So it's really faith alone, but then they have works that demonstrate that faith. Uh, so the first thing to understand is that they are, the first thing they need to do is to repent. Um, John, uh, Matthew 3, 2, John the Baptist says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, then in Matthew 4 and verse 17, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent simply means, we think of it a lot of times, churchianity will define repentance as changing or as, as turning from your sins, and that's, that's not what repentance is. We can't turn from our sins. Uh, Romans 5, uh, 8 says, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 3 says, there is none good, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. So we do not have the capacity, because we are not good, we are not righteous, uh, we do not have the capacity to turn from our sins. So God does not expect us to do that in order to be saved. Instead, we need to change our mind. And for Israel, if you look in Isaiah chapter 64, the problem that Israel had, and you see it when you're in, uh, when Jesus is on earth in the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that they thought that they did not have any sin to repent of. They figured that because they're physical Jews and the promise was given to Abraham and their descendants of Abraham physically speaking, they thought that they had right to go into the kingdom just based upon that. Um, they could... Uh, that they that now and the religious leaders would tell them that uh, the religious leaders could sort of excommunicate them from it. It's sort of like what the Catholic Church would do. The Catholic Church says you got to be part of our church in order to um, to basically to be saved, and so you got to take the mass, you got to go confession, and if you you can do certain things, go against their teachings to where the Catholic Church would say they've excommunicated you. And as far as they're concerned, it means that you're not going to go to heaven because you're not part of their church. That's how, that's what Israel had done, is they thought because they're physical descendants of Abraham, 
that they would automatically go into the kingdom. But that's not the case. Um, Paul makes it very plain, and, and Jesus does too. He said, well, he told, Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8, if you were Abraham's seed, you would do the works of Abraham. And the works of Abraham is to believe God to save you. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, uh, God tells Israel through the mouth of the, uh, through, the uh, through Isaiah the prophet, uh, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. So what they have to do then is they have to turn to the Lord and basically change their mind, repent. That's what repentance means. Stop trusting in their own righteousness and trust in God to save them. You see in verse 8 it says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thine hand. So they can turn to the Lord by changing their mind, stop trusting in their religion or the fact that they're physical descendants of Abraham. Don't trust in that to be saved, but trust in God to save them. Turn to the Lord and say, well, you are the potter, we are the clay, therefore we're going to allow you to mold us into your image. So we're going to believe what you tell us to believe. Again, it's not a work that they can do. Um, if, if you look in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16, in Galatians 2 verse 16, now, Paul, of course, is talking about the dispensation of grace, but, but this still applies regardless of what dispensation you're in. Uh, this applies. Galatians 2, verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. And here's a statement I wanted you to see at the end here. It says, For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Uh, so that means us in the dispensation of grace. That means Israel in their program. That They're not going to be justified by the works of the law because they're going to have the same problem we would have. If they uh, change their mind, trust in God to save them, uh, they're water baptized, but then if they have to do the Mosaic Law after that, they're going to mess up at some point and lose their salvation. So they're kept, as this verse says, when we believe in Jesus Christ, and for Israel that means believing the message that Jesus Christ has given them, which is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, be water baptized, and when they believe that, then they receive the faith of Jesus Christ, and then they have to uh, endure until the end, meaning that they don't take the mark of the beast, they don't worship the image of the beast, and if they do that, then their faith will save them. The faith, them believing, and then the faith of Christ saves them as they get the atonement at Jesus' second coming. So they have to stop trusting in their own self-righteousness, trusting God to save them. God is the one who gives them His righteousness. Second Peter, if you go to Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, this is a good, you know, this is the introduction. And a lot of times with these epistles, whether they be Paul's epistles or the Hebrew epistles, um, a lot of times people just skip over the first part of it saying, well, it's, it's just the salutation, so we pretty much ignore that. But there's a lot of information usually in the beginning of each of these epistles. And that's the case here. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a really good summary statement to show how Israel is saved. Now, of course, you know, they have to understand what he says over in uh, 1 Peter 3. If you go to 1 Peter 3, uh, they have to... For them, because they have a, for, for us, we have to change our mind, trust, which is repent, trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin. But for Israel, 
uh, they have a different gospel, they still repent, change their mind, stop trusting in their own righteousness, trust in God to save them. And the way they show that they've affirmed to that is by being water baptized. Uh, the reason they have to do that is because they are under the Mosaic Law, which is a fleshly ordinance, carnal ordinances. And so there's a fleshly ordinance of the water baptism to show that they are, that they've agreed to be part of the kingdom of priests that will reach the Gentiles in the millennial reign so that the Gentiles may be saved. So they have to, not only do they, so they trust, but that's not a work of the law. It's still a work of faith. It's once they believe the gospel that they stop trusting in their own righteousness, they trust in God to save them. And so then they, by faith, put themselves under that Mosaic law and then they show that by being water baptized. And then they are saved um, as long as they endure unto the end, meaning they don't take the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast. And so then they have salvation. If they, they put themselves under that Mosaic law, but if they disobey it, they don't lose their salvation because guess what? They will disobey it at some point. Uh, so 1 Peter 3, uh, look in verse 20. 1 Peter 3, verse 20 says, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was up preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. They're saved by water uh, because they were saved from drowning, basically. And then verse 21 says, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. So water baptism is required in addition to changing their mind. And, and you notice it's, he's very careful to show you that this is a work of faith. The water baptism is a work of faith, not a work of the law because of the parenthetical reference there. So verse 21 says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, you're not... Water, water baptism, all it does, it's not you saying, okay, I am going to obey the Mosaic Law perfectly. Because the Mosaic Law was a fleshly covenant. Car Hebrews 9, 14 calls it carnal ordinances. Um, so he's saying this isn't, when you get water baptized, you're not putting away the filth of the flesh. You're not saying that I am going to obey the Mosaic Law, which was a fleshly covenant. But it says what it is, it says that water baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. The good conscience, you had a, a guilty conscience before you're saved. Uh, look, look over in Hebrews 9. Hold your place there, look at Hebrews 9, so you can see, um, see what we're talking about. So the water baptism is necessary for their soul salvation, but it is uh, not a work of the flesh. You see in Hebrews 9 and verse 13, it says in Hebrews 9, 13, that the Mosaic law, it says, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean. So that was provision under the Mosaic law. If those things, it says, they sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. So it shows that the Mosaic law is a fleshly covenant. So if you do the animal sacrifices, your flesh is pure. But of course the problem is, then you sin again and your flesh is impure. So that's why they had to keep doing the sacrifices over and over. Now verse 14 says, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Your conscience is part of your soul. You're a three-part being, your spirit, soul, and body. So the Mosaic law pertains, sacrifices there pertain to the purifying of the flesh or the body. But the blood of Christ, when they believe, when Israel repents, they change their mind and they trust in God to save them. They put themselves under the Mosaic law. Then they're water baptized then it says that the blood of Christ purges their conscience. So now their soul, because the conscience is part of the soul, now their soul is purged. And what's it purged from? 
purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The dead works would be verse 13, the blood of bulls, goats, ashes, heifers, sprinkling the unclean. Why? Because Hebrews 10.4 says, Hebrews 10.4 says, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So those animal sacrifices are the things in the, under the Mosaic law purified their flesh, but it didn't purge or the sins off of their soul. It wasn't possible for a flesh, the fleshly animal, to take away sins on the soul of a, um, of a person because the blood isn't similar. It's animal, animal blood, which doesn't have an eternal soul, as opposed to a human blood, which does have an eternal soul. So the blood of Christ had to be offered, Hebrews 9, 14. The blood of Christ had to be offered, and then that, his blood, because it's like kinsman redeemer for Israel there, he's a Jew, he is a man, and his blood is pure without sin, then that blood of Christ then can purge their their conscience from the dead works, from them trying to obey God through the flesh, and instead now they can serve the living God. So how do they serve the living God? Going back to 1 Peter 3, it says now since their conscience is purged from the dead works, they've got a what the scripture refers to as a good conscience. Uh, it was bad before because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, but because now the, the conscience has been purged from the dead works. Now it's a good conscience. So now 1 Peter 3.21, when it talks about baptism doth also now save us, it's very clear, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Although water baptism is a fleshly ordinance and it's something that's needed because they're under the Mosaic law, it does not, um, it is not a work of the law. Rather the water baptism Instead of it being say, saying, I'm going to be under the Mosaic Law and I'm going to obey that Mosaic Law, I've got to do it in order to maintain my salvation. What it says is the water baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's why the scripture, it says, repent. Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. So you change your mind. You start. This is Israel we're talking about. They stop trusting in their own righteousness. They trust in God to give the than his imputed righteousness. So when they do that, then the blood of Christ, according to Hebrews 9.14, is going to purge their conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So now their conscience, which was a bad conscience, because it has these dead works attached to it, it's basically the Romans 7 struggle. Is I've got, I've got a conscience, and I've got the sin nature, and I'm going to disobey what the conscience says, due to the fact that the sin nature makes me do it. So then my conscience is bad in the sense that as a result of the conscience working with the sin nature, it creates sin, which results in the dead works. So he says, but once you're saved, remember Hebrews 9.14, is that the blood of Christ purges the conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. So now, since they've changed their mind, repented, They've believed in Christ, Galatians 2.16. Then the faith of Christ is given unto them. And then when they... Um, and so then, uh, now they have a good conscience. So then the good conscience says, I need to do the work of faith, which is water baptism. In order to... Uh, and so water baptism, according to 1 Peter 3.21, is the answer of a good conscience toward God. So it's, it's important to note that because when people, because a lot of times when you go to Acts 2.38 and people see that repent and be baptized, they think, oh, well, baptism is a work. So they're saved by faith plus works. And it is a work, but it's a work of faith. It's not, as 1 Peter 3.21 says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. So it's not a work of the, work of the law, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's the work of faith because the conscience became good when the blood of Christ was applied and they were given the faith of Christ. So now they can operate with a work of faith, which is what James 2.24 is talking about. And so then they have to um, remain in faith. 
they endure unto the end. That's why Hebrews will have those passages. It talks about they can fall away. And it's impossible to renew them again into repentance. Um, and what that means basically is halfway through the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to cause all people to either take the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast, actually both. Um, and if they do that, then what they've done is they've denied the faith because they're basically pledging their eternal allegiance to Satan through the Antichrist. Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. So they make the conscience choice because they've got the faith of Christ and they've got the good conscience. And the water baptism was the answer of a good conscience. But instead they decide to ignore that and instead pledge their eternal allegiance to Satan by bowing down to the image of the beast or taking the mark of the beast. And when they do that, then they have not endured unto the end. So it's like, it's like the opposite of work. It's a work of you know, water baptism being a work of faith. Bowing down to the image would be a work of, of unbelief. Or you could say belief in Satan uh, through the Antichrist instead of believing God to save them. And, so, and the way we know that that's how they fall away is if you look over in Revelation 14. Revelation 14. Revelation 14 and verses 9 through 11. Revelation 14 verse 9 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Uh, so we know that the way they don't endure unto the end or they lose their salvation is by taking the mark or worshiping the image because that's what this says. And there's no provision for, well, you could repent and be saved. There's nothing in that says if you take the mark or you worship the image, then you're going to suffer forever in a lake of fires, basically, and, and torment there. So basically is what it's saying. So um, we know then that that's how they can lose their salvation. So uh, it's very important to understand that they are not kept by works of the law. Because as Galatians 2.16 says, uh, no flesh will be justified by the works of the law. They're justified by the faith of Christ. And Israel does not receive the, while they do receive the faith of Christ, they do not receive the justification. They are not justified until Jesus' second coming. And it's because of this provision. And the reason God does it that way is because of their status of unbelief and how God gave them the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law treats them like children. Uh, basically, they're under that law until Jesus' second coming, and then they go under the New Covenant. Uh, so, they're, so they're subject to, uh, they're treated like children, basically, until they believe the gospel, endure unto the end, and Jesus comes back. Then they're placed under that New Covenant. But in the meantime, basically because of that child status, you got to see how it plays out. You know, it's just like if if you had say ten million dollars and you put it in your um, in your will that you're going to give ten million dollars to your children. Well, they are not actually going to get it as children because they're not really. Um, you can't really trust them to use it responsibly. So they have to wait and just put in a trust fund, and they have to wait until they're eighteen to be able to uh, get that money. So. If they do something terrible, you know, if they kill somebody before then, well, then they're not going to get it. Well, um, Jesus says that in John 8 that, that Satan is a murderer from the beginning. And those who follow that religious system and don't have faith in what God has told them, the gospel, that they are children of the devil. So uh, by association, then they are also murderers, spiritually speaking. Even though physically they might not kill anybody, spiritually speaking, they are murderers. And so a murderer, uh, if you have a 16-year-old child that's going to get $10 million inheritance and he goes out and murders somebody, well, he's not going to get it now um, because he doesn't deserve it. He's now a criminal. So it's the same thing when it comes to their Israel salvation. They're treated as children. 
until they believe, until Jesus comes back at the second coming. And then they show that they are really part of the believing remnant and they haven't aligned themselves with the Antichrist and Satan. So then that means they are not by association murderers and so then they are given the inheritance, which is basically eternal life and God's kingdom on earth. So that's a real short summary of Israel being saved. So we see passages like James 2.24, and it says that uh, you see then how a man is justified by works in addition and not by faith only. And we have to understand that's works of faith, which for them is you have the answer of a of a good conscience toward God by being water baptized and then you uh, continue in enduring in that faith until the end not taking the mark of the beast or not worshiping the image of the beast okay so uh, with that in mind after we've cleared up how they're say what they believe and with that in mind now let's look at what actually some of the events that take place with uh, on Satan's side basically to once Israel's program resumes so let's go over to um, Daniel uh, chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. One thing we need to understand, and sometimes there's confusion about this, is Daniel 9 mentions in verse 24 that there are 70 weeks uh, determined for uh, on Israel there. Those weeks are weeks of years. So you got 70 times 7, because there's seven, 7 in a week. You know, 7 days in a week, so 7... Uh, years in a week in order to be a week of years so that would be 490 years there so 70 weeks and then you've got in uh, verse 25 it tells you know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks so seven weeks uh, three score is 60 and then two weeks, so seven plus 60 plus two is 69 weeks. And we're told that the 69 weeks end at uh, verse 26 says, after the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So uh, it's after, notice it says after. So the 69 weeks are fulfilled. And then after the 69 weeks, so so that right there tells you, um, and well, well, let's keep reading. So verse 26, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come. So the prince that shall come is the Antichrist. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he, that's the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's the 70th week. And then it tells you, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So basically a lot of big words there. Basically what it's saying is that the abomination of desolation, uh, that is the image of the beast. So halfway through the 70th week of Daniel, the Antichrist will set up the image of the beast um, in the temple and try to get everybody to bow down and worship him. But you notice here, notice it doesn't, what we need to understand is that the 69th, the 70th week of Daniel did not begin at Jesus' ascension or it didn't begin at Pentecost in Acts 2. The 70th week has not begun yet. Because the 69th, after the 69th week was over, we're told in verse 26, after, you want to underline that word after, after three score and two weeks, which is, you know, in verse 25 you had seven weeks, then you have three score and two. So it's basically saying after 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And that cut off is uh, cross-references Isaiah 53 verse 8. Isaiah 53 verse 8 says that the Messiah or the Christ will be cut off from the land of the living. So that's what it means when it says cut off. It means basically he's crucified. So it's after the 69th week he's crucified. So we know and then the 70th week starts according to verse 27. It starts when the Antichrist confirms a covenant. He makes a seven-year covenant 
with the nation of Israel. And that's known as the tribulation period. So between the 69th and 70th week, we know that the Messiah is crucified. And then verse 26 goes on to say that the people of the prince, so the people of the Antichrist, are going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. And then, um, then the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined, and then he's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, the, the verse continues. It says, In the midst of the week he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now, I don't have, uh, didn't plan to go through the verses, but if you look in um, other parts in, in the prophecy section here in Daniel, you'll see that uh, basically the sac and Well, in other words, you can see it here too as well. If he's going to cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, then that tells you that the Antichrist is going to set up the sacrificial, the animal sacrificial system again. So he's going to set it up or else he couldn't cause it to cease. You know, you wouldn't say today that uh, the Baptist church has caused the animal sacrifices to cease because they never did the animal sacrifices. In order to cause it to cease, you got to have it going first. So what, what has to happen in the, in the gap between the 69th and 70th week is the Messiah is cut off, then there are people of the Antichrist that come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and then they have to rebuild the temple, and, uh, and then because in order to have a sanctuary uh, in order to do the sacrifices in. And, uh, and that's one way that he shows that he is the Christ is because, or we read on Sunday, Zechariah 6, that the Lord says he is going to build the temple. The Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, says the Lord Jesus Christ is going to build that temple. So the Antichrist, he says, well, I'm the Christ because I got rid of that bad one that's there, probably that mosque that's over there now, and he'll set up a Jewish temple. He'll take away the Islamic one, set up a Jewish one, and start the animal sacrifices. And then he's going to confirm a covenant with them for, for seven years. So until those events happen, the 70th week hasn't started yet. Now if you go to 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, in 2 Thessalonians 2, you'll see that the Antichrist isn't revealed until after the church, the body of Christ, is raptured up. Uh, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, um, verse 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, it says, that ye, be not so, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ meaning the time he comes uh, at after the tribulation period, the second coming, the uh, you know, destruction of the Antichrist and his forces, bringing Israel into the kingdom. Um, that day of Christ is not at hand because Paul is talking to the body of Christ. He's not talking to Israel. And the day of Christ comes at the end of the 70th week. And we haven't even started the 70th week yet. So the day of Christ can't be at hand yet because we haven't, uh, you know, we're not in Israel's program. So he says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, the day of Christ shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And we talked about last week how the, the, the rapture of the body of Christ will take place when you're at a point where pretty much no one is going to be saved. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe we are at that uh, falling away. Maybe that's happening right now. I don't know. But there's got to be a falling away first. And then what ends up happening is the, ra the rapture takes place. And then it says, That man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's not able to do that until halfway through the tribulation period. Um, which is why he doesn't set up the abomination of desolation or the image of the beast 
until halfway through the tribulation period. But, uh, but basically, Paul is going through events that have to take place after the rapture before the day of Christ or Jesus' second coming takes place. Is that there has to be a falling away first in order for the fullness of the Gentiles to be come in for there to be a rapture. Then Israel's program can resume and then that man of sin can be revealed and then he can, halfway through the tribulation period, sit in the temple, declare himself to be God. Um, you notice in verse 6, it says, Now ye know what withholdeth, that he might re be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So that's a reference to the Antichrist. And so it's saying there that right now, the Antichrist is not going to be revealed until he who now letteth is taken out of the way. And that he there is the body of Christ. So until the body of Christ is taken out of the way, meaning we're raptured up, then the Antichrist can be revealed. And so, and remember from last time that we read from uh, Romans chapter 9 last time that in verse uh, 28, in Romans 9, 28, that uh, when the Lord does resume Israel's program, it's not going to take 2,000 years like it's taken from the beginning of the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts 9 to now. It's been approximately 2,000 years. But remember what we talked about last time is because if 2 Thessalonians 2.3 takes place where there's a falling away, which again may be happening right now, um, to the point where you're not getting people saved, then God says, okay, fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So then the Lord Jesus Christ raptures up the body of Christ because uh, other people, you know, people aren't getting saved. So the fullness has come in. And so then the body of Christ is taken out of the way and now the Antichrist can be revealed. And, you know, he doesn't have to live 2,000 years because we're told in Romans 9, 28 that God will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And we mentioned last time how corrupt, you look at how corrupt the world is now. Well, if there's a falling away, which results in uh, people are not being saved anymore, well then it means that the whole world is so corrupt that God takes away the body of Christ, he starts Israel's program, and Israel will use the sign, because the Jews require a sign, they will see the sign of the rapture of the body of Christ, and that will cause them to believe and to be saved. But the Lord recognizes the deception program of Satan will be at its peak during, uh, during the resumption of Israel's program. And so they will be able to turn it around to make, look like, make it look like God is the bad guy and Satan is the good guy. And so that's why Romans 9.28 says that he has to finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. He has to make it a short work or else, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, if the time is not cut short, then the Antichrist would be able to deceive even the very elect, and then no flesh would be saved. And I get that reference for you. Uh, that was Matthew, that's Matthew 24 and verse 24. That if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And verse 22 says, no flesh would be saved. So that's Matthew 24, 22 and 24. So he has a short work. So that means once the, while the 70th week of Daniel does not start immediately upon the rapture of the body of Christ, there are these events that have to take place in the meantime. We know that the Lord will make a short work. And short in terms of eternity, you know, how short is it? Oh, I don't know. I know it's not going to be 2,000 years. And it's really going to be to the point where and God in his foreknowledge would know uh, how long it will take for Satan to twist around the sign of the rapture as a good thing 
and twist it around to be a bad thing as, as to make God out to be some evil person who had a UFO and took us away, like, you know, like the aliens come invaded us or whatever it is he says, um, and uh, how long, how many years it would take for that to happen. So the Lord knows that, and he knows he has to get Israel saved during that short time, a short work. Uh, we do know that, as we saw in Daniel 9, that there are some events that have to take place. There is the destruction of the city and the sanctuary, and then a, another temple being built, now, some people will say that that happened in A.D. 70, and that's true that, that the, the temple was destroyed at that time. Uh, but Daniel 9 tells us it's the people of the prince that shall come. It's the people of the Antichrist who is doing that. And according to 2 Thessalonians 2, the Antichrist is not revealed until after the, once the rapture of the church takes place. So I would still say that that's future. And even if it's not... Uh, you know, even if AD 70 is the destruction of the city and the, and the temple, which another problem is that the dispensation of grace has already started, so the prophecy program was put on hold. But even if it was that fulfilling, you still have to have the Antichrist set up a Jewish synagogue or Jewish temple, or somebody would have to have that temple in place in order for him to make that seven-year covenant and start the animal sacrifices there. Uh, so, those, uh, so I take it to be that the destruction there in Daniel 9.26 is still future. Now, uh, if you look in Daniel 11, there are, there are some things that indicate that it will be a period of years. Um, I think it's got to be at least 40 years uh, before the start of the, or at least 33 years before the start of the tribulation period, a total maybe of 40 years, I think at the least, um, uh, but it could be more than that. And Daniel 11, it's... And the reason I say that is because there are all these events that take place in Daniel 11. Uh, some will say all of this is... Uh, is uh, you know, a lot of this has already taken place and that we are waiting for the, um, the Antichrist to be revealed. Uh, but I believe the scripture indicates that these, these are things that happen in the end times or the last days for Israel. So I don't... I mean, you could conclude that that's during, you know, Greece and, and uh, Rome and uh, the Medes and Persians. But uh, to me, all of this happens. Um, you, you don't see a big gap here. There are all these wars that go on between the king of the north, the king of the south. And then out of those wars, then the Antichrist comes up. And you see there are years involved here. Uh, Daniel 11. Uh, again, this is a very hard, perhaps the hardest chapter of prophecy to understand. Uh, but but I just want you to see that this is going to take some time. That's all I wanted you to see here. Verse 5, Daniel 11, verse 5, says, The king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together. So there's a period of years that this happens. Uh, then there's uh, verse 7, out of a branch of her roots, one stands up. Uh, verse 8 says that this one who stands up shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the south. So again, we have uh, a period of more years mentioned. And then later on, verse 13, the king of the north shall return and shall set for shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. So in Daniel 11, you have at least three verses that mention periods of years. Verse 6, end of years. Verse 8, he shall continue more years. Verse 13, after certain years. And I think all of this is future uh, because if you continue there, you can see that... Um, it just goes, you know, one after the other, a king of the north, a king of the south. There's these battles. New ones rise up, and it's all between the north and the south. And then you get down to verse 20, and it says, Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. That's the 
Antichrist. You see in verse 22, with the arms of a flood shall, be, shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. So the arms of a flood are mentioned there. We saw in Daniel 9, 26, it says, when the people of the prince shall come, the end thereof shall be with a flood. So there's your flood from, uh, that destroys the temple and the, and the sanctuary. And then verse 23 of Daniel 11, it says, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So there's your seven-year covenant that's made with him. So you can see the, uh, the destruction of the city and the sanctuary takes place uh, during the Antichrist there, not at A.D. 70. And uh, then you've got that league after. But you see there are all these events that have to take place leading up to it. And there are periods of years in Daniel 11, 6, verse 8, and verse 13. So that's why I say there's a, there's a period of these years that take place. And uh, I, I think it has to be at least uh, 33 years. It could be more. You say, how do you come up with 33? Well, um, because 33 and then the seven years of the tribulation would be a total of 40. In your Bible, 40 is a number of probation. Uh, um, uh, Noah, in Noah's day, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, Moses went up on the mountain to meet with the Lord to get the law. He was up there 40 days. Israel was in the wilderness 40 years. Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness 40 days. Um, and it, there are a few other references as well. The 40 keeps showing up as a number of probation or meaning a number of a testing testing time. Uh, so um, it seems like if you got periods of years, it would make sense then that you know that that you would have a 40 year period here. Um, so again, that's just, I guess, um, it could be more, but I, I don't know if it could be less, or it couldn't be much less because you've got periods of years and all this taking place here, according to Daniel 11, before the Antichrist comes up. Then he makes the seven-year covenant with them, and that begins the tribulation period. And then that's when Satan ends up... Now, the, the covenant that the Antichrist makes with the nation is he is just a regional ruler at that time. And, uh, boy, we're out of time. So, But uh, let, let me, let, let's get one more reference. Revelation 6. Let's look at Revelation 6. This Revelation 6 tells you the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period from God's perspective, from a spiritual perspective. Because in Daniel 5, you've got uh, the Lamb, and he is the one who opens up the seals, which are the seven seals of judgment that are mentioned in Revelation 6. And they end, uh, the seals end with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, so it encompasses, the seven seals encompass the entire seven-year tribulation period. And so when he opens in Revelation 6 and verse 1, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, so the first seal is open. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, that is at the beginning of the tribulation period. This is not Jesus. Jesus, in Revelation 19, comes after the tribulation period is over. He comes on a white horse. Uh, but he doesn't come with a bow. He comes with a sword that comes out of his mouth, and that sword is the Word of God. He uses the Word of God to destroy wickedness. This here is Satan, who is the great imitator of Jesus, so he wants people to think. Again, he's trying to set it up to like he's the good guy. The good guy comes on a white horse. If you watch Gunsmoke or Bonanza, you know that the good guy wears the white hat and, wears, and, drives, and rides the white horse. The bad guy has the black hat. So if it's a white horse, that this guy must be the good guy. Revelation 19 tells you that Jesus comes on a white horse. So Satan, trying to mimic Jesus, comes on the white horse. And we know it's Satan because he doesn't come with a sword, but he comes with a bow. And you notice a crown was given unto him. It's given to him. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, but it was not given to him. He had to fight for it. 
Satan says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you bow down and worship me. He says, I'm not going to do that. I, the Lord is the only God. God the Father, I'm going to serve Him. I'm going to do what my Father told me to do. And he goes to the cross and he dies and he fights death and hell and gets those keys of death and hell because he fought against them and defeated them and got the victory due to his perfect sinless life. So Jesus Christ is King of Kings, has the biggest crown of all, but it wasn't given to him. He earned it by living a perfect life, always having faith in what the Father told him to do and fighting and winning the victory over death and hell. This guy here, he gets a crown given unto him. So this is Satan. And you notice it says he went forth conquering and to conquer. So the Antichrist makes a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel that begins the seven-year tribulation period. And then what happens is that uh, the Satan goes and now he's going to go forth and conquer so he can get the whole world and have um, put all the power under the Antichrist uh, halfway through the tribulation period. So the Antichrist is the ruler of the I Israel in that region for uh, at the beginning of the seven years and then halfway through he becomes the world leader. And uh, let's very quickly to see Revelation uh, Revelation uh, eight uh, seventeen uh, Revelation seventeen so you can see this Revelation seventeen we, we don't have time to run all the verses but basically um, there is a continuing theme in Revelation where the bad guys whether it be the great whore Babylon whether it be Satan whether it be the Antichrist uh, all three of them have you see there in Revelation seventeen three and this is the uh, this is the Babylon, the woman Babylon. It says, He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The devil is shown as having seven heads and ten horns. You can do a concordance, run a reference to see this. The devil has seven heads and ten horns. The, um, the woman Babylon has seven heads and ten horns. The Antichrist has seven heads and ten horns. And the reason is because it represents the first half of the tribulation period is represents the seven heads. And then the last half is the ten horns. And you see that you go down in Revelation 17 to um, verse 9. Revelation 17, 9. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. So the, the tribulation period starts with the world divided into seven regions, with seven kings, one over each region. It says, um, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. The one who's coming is the beast. Verse 11 says, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. I know that's confusing, but basically it's saying, the reason is because the Antichrist is killed halfway through the tribulation period and he's resurrected as a beast. Again, the mimic that he is the Messiah because he's resurrected from the dead. He's resurrected as a beast. So that's how he is of the seven because he's the man of sin, the Antichrist, during the first half of the tribulation period, ruling over his region of the world, Israel, and that area as the world is divided into seven regions. But then he is resurrected as a beast and then verse 12 says, The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So that's how you know the Antichrist for the last half of the tribulation period is the one world ruler. He rules, he's one of seven kings during the first half of the tribulation period, ruling over his region of the world, Israel, and that surrounding area. Then, uh, halfway through, uh, he becomes the world ruler. There are ten kings under him. They all give their power and strength to him. So he's the one world ruler over ten regions then. Um, so Satan does, gets the crown there in Revelation 6 to begin the tribulation period, and he goes forth to conquer so that he has the power to, to do all of this, basically. That uh, they make the covenant with, Israel makes the covenant with the Antichrist, and then 
Satan goes forth and conquers to the point where now he can put all the power under the Antichrist as the one world ruler halfway through the tribulation period. Um, and so we're over, so that's where we'll stop. Next week, we'll look at what God does while this is happening, how he gets Israel saved while Satan is doing this work. And dear Lord, we just thank you for your grace and mercy that you've extended the dispensation of grace 2,000 years. The Gentiles, who didn't even deserve your mercy because of our unbelief, uh, you've now given us mercy, you've given us grace, you've given us the opportunity to have eternal life in heavenly places. Help us, Lord, to continue as ambassadors for Christ, sharing the gospel to others so that they may be saved, and, uh, and then helping in lessons like this to help the people who remain after us uh, to understand what's going on once Israel's program resumes so that if they miss the rapture, they can be saved um, once in Israel's program. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.